This is the Financially Simple Podcast, a show dedicated to destroying the complexities of money for today's small business owner. And now, here's your host, pizza-loving, certified financial planner, Justin Goodbread. Welcome to Financially Simple. This is a finance show for small business owners about money, how it works in our business and personal lives, and how we can build wealth to be financially independent. I'm your host, Justin Goodbrand, and today we continue in our series called Growing the Value of Our Company. Today's episode deals in the area of planning. And if you'll remember, in the last few episodes, we dealt with there are eight core areas of business. The first one is planning, and today we start actually our first deep dive into the area of planning. And today I specifically want to deal with the topic of the strategic planning outline, long-term planning for increased business value. In the 2003 book Moneyball, The Art of Winning an Unfair Game, the author Michael Lewis highlights the Oakland Athletics baseball team. This particular team was managed by Billy Bean, and Billy and the economist from Yale's named Peter Brand went out to build a low-cost baseball team. They actually used this metrics called Saber Metrics, which at the time was relatively new, and the idea behind it was using a number of calculations ultimately to build a team which had significantly lower salary costs than the competition, but could yield better results. The theory behind Moneyball, what's become known as today, was explained, then it was tested, and it was implemented, and ultimately proven successful not only for the Oakland Athletics, but for many other teams in the future. Now, I realize for us baseball aficionados, someone who actually has better baseball understanding than I do, that I just oversimplified the complicated sabermetrics calculation. What I'm interested in is not the sabermetrics, though. What I'm interested in is noting the strategic planning method, which is highlighted in this very quick story. It's a great book, The Money Ball. It's a great book to read. But what's interesting to me is that in the story and in the real-life event, a vision was cast. Hey, can we build a baseball team which uses different type of metrics that can give us better results? That's the vision. Then it was tested. They began testing some things. In fact, I was reading, and Billy Bean actually asked the young economist Peter Brand, what happened if we ran the same metrics on me? And he said, well, you've been an average player. And that's, I think Billy Bean said, yeah, that's exactly what happened. So it was tested. Then it was executed. They actually went about to actually implement this system called Sabermetrics, and the results were seen. It was unbelievable. Now, because of this planning, books were written, (laughs) and the movie starring Brad Pitt came about. An entire American sport, baseball, was ultimately changed as a result of planning. Now, look, there are several different types of planning for business owners can use. We use business planning when starting a business. We say, hey, do you have a business plan? Maybe the bank asks for a business plan. We use project planning whenever we start a new project, or we use risk planning whenever we're trying to mitigate risk. And all of these methods have credibility. They all should be used. However, one of the most valuable planning methods used to increase the value of our business is called strategic planning. When you look at strategic planning on the web, there's many different definitions. I found this one from Investopedia, and it said, strategic planning is an organization's process of defining its strategy or direction and making decisions on allocating its resources to pursue this strategy. See, often when I talk about strategic planning with business owners, there's a major disconnect on how strategic business planning affects day-to-day operations. Many business owners are so focused on the immediate and now that we often forget the future. So if I can use an illustration to explain what I'm trying to communicate, you know, most Americans today, we drive a car. I drive a car some 20 miles to work every day. I go down back country roads. I drive the interstate. I get to see the Tennessee mountains. I get to see the Tennessee lakes. I see deer and turkey just about every morning on my drive, but I drive a car. I like it. I like to drive a car. It gives me a chance to get out a little bit and think a little bit. And if I were comparing the world of planning to driving a car, So many of us are focused on the road just in front of us, just in front of us. What's around the next curve that we forget actually where we're headed? I mean, think about it. If I just got out of my house just to drive a car and I started driving just down the road, I don't know where I could end up if I wasn't thinking about where I'm going. 
You know, I could end up at the office by habit. I've had many times we drive to church on Sunday mornings and not many times my habit is I drive to the office. I'll get in the car and start driving to church. And my wife's like, yeah, you just missed the exit again. (laughs) And because I'm so focused on actually driving that I'm not focused on where I'm going. That's what happens many times for us business owners that we are so focused on this next exact step that we don't think about where we're going to end up. As the old saying goes, I heard this a million times in my life. My dad used to say, son, if you aim at nothing, you're going to hit it every time. And that's what many of us business owners do. So my goal today is to address the strategic planning process. I just want to give you an overview of it. And then I want to come back in detail over the next few episodes and deal with the individual elements of this process. So it may take us some four or five episodes to get through the entire strategic planning process. But it's very valuable. In fact, I just completed this process in my company, Heritage Investors. Most of you know I have a firm that I own, that I work in majority of my time, that I meet with actually business-owned clients and retirees on helping them achieve their personal financial goals. I act as a certified financial planner some 40 hours a week. And every day, I'm focusing on helping others accomplish their goals that during July, we take the time to do our strategic planning. And in fact, we just did this in our office. I'm going to talk about this a little bit as we go through this process in this podcast today. But I have just completed this with Heritage Investors, my company. We talked about who we want to work with. We talked about the number of clients we want to try to reach. We talked about the revenues we want to reach. We talked about the pros, the cons. We're going to deal with this today, but I want to give you an outline. I want to give you an outline about what this strategic planning deals with. Then we're going to deal with who should be present, who should be a part of the strategic planning process, and ultimately where should it take place and when, when, what time of the year, when should this event take place? The acronym I want to give you is VMOSTA. That's the way I say it, VMOSTA. And you actually spell that out, VM versus OSTA. So you go VM, Victor, Matthew, Victor, S, I forget, let's say Steve, Oscar, Steve, Tango, Alpha. So V-Mosta. And it's an acronym that I use to go through the strategic planning process. So let me lay it out for you this way. First of all, V. V stands for vision. And you're like, oh, brother, Justin, seriously? Yeah, I get it. Here's the thing that I get ticked off with when I hear the word vision is I run into these, quote, business consultants who work somewhere in some corporate division somewhere, and so they happen to work underneath a big firm, someone like a GE during whenever Jack Welch was there, and all of a sudden they're like, yeah, I was the VP of sales in this thing, and we always talked about vision. Let's talk about the vision in your small company. And I want to say, dude, you're wasting my time. Vision's not going to help me today answer the problem. Well, I want to take a step back and say, what is vision And second of all, what is mission? See, in the strategic planning framework, that's kind of like where we're headed to. And so many times I feel like, and I've heard these lectures, guys. I've heard business consultants get out there and talk about vision and mission, and I feel like they missed the boat. They want to bullet it down to one simple word, and you've got to be able to quote this throughout the whole firm. And there's some study which says that that's true. I get it. But ultimately, where are we going to be five years from now? That's the idea behind vision and mission. So VM stands for vision and mission, and that's your outlook. That's showing where you're going to be in five years. The VS stands for your values and your SWOT. So your vision, your mission, and your values are what are you trying to accomplish? The SWOT, S-W-O-T, the SWOT analysis, and that's S-W-O-T stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And that's going to be a fun episode just to hang down on why so many people mess up the SWOT analysis. But a SWOT analysis is dealing with the current state of the organization. Where's our strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats? How are we dealing with this? So you start off with your vision, your mission. You deal with those first. You know where you're headed. You deal with your values. Are the values of the organization where they align with where you're headed? I was in a meeting not too long ago, and we actually had to deal with the values. And we'll talk about that in some of the upcoming episodes. So values are important. SWAT, strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threat. So the SWAT gives you a current state. Then you come to VM, VS, and then it comes to OS, and that stands for Objectives and Strategies. What are we trying to accomplish over the next three years? So we know we want to be in five years, but what specifically are we trying to accomplish in the next three years? And what are the exact strategies that we're going to utilize to get there? So I was with a dentist this last week, and the dentist said, I would like to have a second location in the next three years. That's the objective, number one. 
And there's all reasons for it. We know the vision, we know the mission, we know the values, and we know the SWOT analysis right now. But the objective was, I'd like to have a second location in three years. Okay, that's our objective. What's the strategies? Man, we threw so much mud against the wall in that meeting. We came down to three specific strategies that we had to take. That's great. Then we deal with the most of the T is the last one. That's tactics. What are the things we're going to do over the next year to help us reach our objective? And actually, what are the three things we're going to do to help us reach our objective? Then we get to the actions. The actions are what we're going to deal with on a three-month time period to help us reach our tactic. So VMOSTA stands for Vision, Mission, Values, SWAT, Objectives, Strategies, Tactics, and Actions. And if you heard my time frame there, Vision and Mission and Values, the VMV, Vision, Mission, Values, that takes place over a five-year analysis. Where are you going to be in five years? That's what we're looking for. The next one is your SWAT. That's giving you a quick look on where you're at right now. Your objectives are what you're trying to accomplish in the next three years. Your objectives and your strategies. Here's where we're going to be in three years' time. Your tactics are what's going to help you get there, and you're going to measure your tactics over a one-year time, sometimes 18 months. What are we going to accomplish over the next year to get us to our strategies, to reach our objectives? And then ultimately, what actions are we going to take? The actions are what's going to take on a quarterly basis or every three months. You are listening to Financially Simple, destroying the complexities of money for today's small business owner. It's interesting when you look at the process, you have to deal with who is involved in this. So your vision, your mission is you, the owner. That's you, your values. That is you, the owner. You're the owner. You set these out. If you are the owner and you've got a management team underneath you, then you have your management team involved in this. So your management team deals with your vision, your missions, your values. Are we actually doing what we set out to do? You deal with your SWOT analysis. You for sure have your management team involved in the SWOT, and you for sure have your management team involved in the objectives and the strategies. Now you say, Justin, I'm on a business by myself. Great. You're the decision maker. You have to set the vision. You have to set the mission. You have to know the values you're trying to achieve for long-term viability of the organization. You have to look at the strengths, weakness, opportunities, and threats. You have to know the objectives, and you have to know the strategies to get to those objectives. And at this point, you're saying, dude, there is no way. And you're right. There is no way. This is why you hire someone like me. This is why you hire a business advisor or you hire somebody who can look holistically and challenge you. This is why coaches exist. You want to get somebody in your corner who can walk you through this. I was actually conducting one of these two-day planning sessions. So we do a two-day planning session out of our company to help our business owners. And we had a business owner who's like, Justin, I want to sell the business in five years. I'm like, cool, let's make it happen. But we got to double the value of the business. He's like, yeah, good luck with that. And I said, no, we're going to lay it out. We're going to go through the actual tactics. We know what we want to accomplish in five years. We know what the mission is. That's our five-year goal. Now let's deal with the values of SWAT, the objectives, and the strategies. So we did a two-day meeting just on Vimosta in the organization. They paid for our team to come involved. We actually had to fly to a different state. And it was very effective because once we got the management team on board, in this case it was the owner and his wife, was the management team, once we got them on board to understand what the objectives were, then we brought in their 17 employees. And they actually had managers, but they just didn't want the managers involved. We brought in the 17 employees, and we started dealing with the tactics. So everybody was involved in dealing with the tactics. Okay, here's the strategies that we want to accomplish. Now, how do we get there? Because you want to get feedback from the whole organization. I was in a meeting not too long ago with a very large company. It was a manufacturing-style company. And the business owner made this statement. He said, you know, guys, before I started including my rank and files, and that was the term he used. I'm just repeating what he said. He said, before I started including my rank and files, and I was just relying on my management team, I was missing so much information from the ground up. He said, whenever I got out there and I started getting the people who were on the assembly line, the people who were dealing with the actual machines, making recommendations, once that happened, the management, the mid-level management wasn't so much concerned of covering themselves from an accident. They weren't so much concerned on their education. They were actually listening to the people who were dealing with the activity day in, day out. Imagine going to war. I used an analogy this last time about the army. Imagine going to war and you have men on the ground, men in the actual gunfight, and they're trying to call in air support. But you have the people back at the office who aren't there fighting, who can't see what they're dealing with, who are second-guessing everything. 
then we would lose soldiers and we wouldn't have victory in the battle. Another scenario that you have when it comes to tactics and action, by now most people understand what Undercover Boss is. It was a program that operated, I forget which channel it was, but I remember watching the trash collecting business. I can't remember the name of the company right now. Waste Management. Waste Management. I remember watching the CEO of Waste Management go undercover. He rode on the trash truck. He listened to people. He talked to people. People were bashing people, and he just sat there and listened. And at the end of it, he was able to gain so much information from the people on the ground, boots on the ground. He's able to get so much information. And so the strategic planning framework allows you to get the information that you need from the entire team. So who's involved? You're going to include you, the business owner, for sure. If you don't have any management with you, then you're going to work with a coach. Even if you have management with you, you probably want to bring a coach in to challenge yourself and challenge a team through this process. And that's hard. It's hard for me, the business owner, to be challenged on what I think. But nonetheless, it's good. It's needed. And then you're going to get your whole team involved. And there's ways to do this. You may say, Justin, I have 500 employees. Not a problem. There's ways to get the tactic and actions to all the employees. That's not a problem. You may say, Justin, I am the owner and the employee. Not a problem. We can deal with that. If you know what you need to accomplish, then you can do this. You can make it happen. So who's involved? Everybody in the organization at some point is involved. When should this happen then? When should strategic planning happen? So I put this as an annual event in my world. And the reason why I do it annually is as follows. Every July, I meet with our organization at Heritage Investors. And we currently have nine total employees and key contractors in the company that help us inside and outside the office. I bring everybody together in that. Now, we're doing it this year in two different meetings, but nonetheless, we bring everybody together. And it allows me a chance to let the new individuals see the vision. It allows them to see the history of where we come from and what we're trying to accomplish. More importantly, it allows me to give out a one-year goal underneath the tactics. Here's what we're trying to accomplish in the next fiscal year. Here's the revenue goals we're trying to make. Here's the strategic initiatives we're trying to do. Here's the weaknesses or the threats we have to mitigate in the next fiscal year. Here's the problems I see. Have you all heard any problems? It gives us a chance to do that. So we meet annually. And then we break it down to quarterly. And guys, this is not my own material. I read this material the first time when I read some years back, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And I always thought this was probably, if not the most comprehensive, the best way to accomplish meeting with an organization. As you meet annually, you forecast out what you want to accomplish. Then you come back quarterly. And after you come back quarter, you see what effects and what changes you make in the last quarter. So you lay out, here's our one-year goal, and we're going to break the one-year goal into four different bite-sized bites. So let's say we're meeting in July, like I just did. Then I'm going to come back in October and say, okay, what did we accomplish that we set out to accomplish in our actions? Our next three months, these are the actions we said we're going to take. What did we accomplish? Where did we have success? Where did we have failure? Where do we need to make modifications on? Not only am I meeting quarterly, but we're meeting monthly now. Every month we know what we have to accomplish that month in order to hit our quarterly goals. So we break that down through our action scenario. So now I'm able to hold accountability across all avenues. Here's what I've noticed. As the business owner who does this, my team now feels empowered to hold me accountable. And that is powerful, friends. If you're a business owner, the minute your team feels like they can hold you accountable, man, I've watched our company's morale. I've watched it go up. I've watched our company now be able to say, I actually own this with Justin or with the team. It's pretty amazing. And then we have weekly meetings. Every week we know we have to accomplish that week. And we're never losing sight of the things we have to accomplish in our next fiscal year. So we've broken it down on a bite-sized scale. (laughs) How do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? That's the old saying, right? That's what we're trying to accomplish here. So then you go to where. Where should we host this meeting? Look, size matters here in this area. In our company, Heritage Investors, we just completed this meeting, as I mentioned, and we actually met in the conference room here in our office. We blocked out two days from appointments. We had four one-and-a-half-hour segments per day. So we ended up meeting for a total of 12 hours over two days. And we were able to completely conduct the strategic planning meeting for our team over that period of time. Now, I have done this with many, many, many of our business owners. They've said, Justin, 
I need some help in conducting a strategic planning meeting. So we'll go in and we charge them a fee for this, obviously. We charge them a fee. They said, Justin, come in and host it. I'll come in and host it. There's a lot of homework to do beforehand. There's a lot of work to do after. But there's a two-day meeting typically, and you could typically accomplish everything you need to accomplish within two days to get a strategic planning meeting. Now, depending on the size of the organization, you may have a lot of homework to do beforehand, and you may have a ton of homework to do afterhand. But you could typically get everything done in about two days' time. So that is the outline for what's called a strategic planning. So we call it a strategic planning framework. So the way I say it is a recap, it says VMOSTA or VM versus OSTA. So that stands for vision, mission, values, the SWOT analysis, objective strategies, tactics, and actions. So over the next few episodes, we're going to deal specifically with each one of these areas. We're going to deal with vision and mission. Are they really a waste of time? We're going to talk about what does it mean to have values within your organization, and is it really a waste of time? We're going to deal with SWAT. What exactly is SWAT? Why has so many people messed that one up? Then what is an objective versus a strategy? How do we walk through this? How do we ultimately get results? Remember, you may be saying, like one of my clients just last week, Justin, I have to double the size of my company. The very first thing we dealt with is this particular framework, friends. We have to make sure all the vision, the missions, the values, the SWAT, the objectives, everything's in place first. Now, there's some homework that has to be done, again, before this meeting takes place. But the reason why this is so valuable is it gets all your team pointed in the exact same direction. And there's no ambiguity. I uh, heard one person one time say, Justin, with no accountability, there is no responsibility. When this is done, everybody knows what they are required to do over the next six months, next year. And more specifically, they know the direct benefit to themselves for accomplishing this said goal. And as you, the owner, if you're trying to add value, we can actually quantify the results in hard dollars of strategic planning. So this is at the heartbeat of driving the value of the company is strategic planning. So I want to spend some time on this in the planning segment, the planning module of the eight core areas. So I'm excited about this, guys. Now we're starting to drive way down into driving the value of our company, and we're going to start high, and it's going to get really, really fun really fast. So I hope you're enjoying this series. I'm enjoying talking with you about it. Hey, reach out to me if you have any questions. I received a cool question this last week, and we're going to be dealing with that here in about another month, dealing with planning. We're going to be dealing with that particular question. It came in through LinkedIn, which I was pretty amazed at. So if you see me out there, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, even on Instagram, I made a photo. We just stained our deck this last weekend on the house. I took a picture of some brown boards. And someone said, dude, Justin, are you going to mention this on the podcast? I'm like, sweet. Somebody's listening on the podcast and they pay attention to my deck. Okay, whatever. I just thought it was kind of cool. Hey, look, we're going to have some graphics on this one on the website, financiallysimple.com. We are catching it up. It's almost there. We're trying to catch it real fast on getting up to speed on the blogs, be catching up with the podcast. It's coming. It's coming. We have a book getting ready to go live. We're going to talk about it here soon. Until then, guys, like I say every week, life is hard. Life is fun. Life is frustrating, but life is good. Life is good. So much to be thankful for. We have so much to be thankful for. Hey, let's go out and make it a great day. You have been listening to the Financially Simple Podcast. The information in this show is for informational purposes only. This show is not investment advice. Instead, seek help from a competent financial advisor. Justin Goodbread, CFP, is an investment advisor representative of Heritage Investors, a registered investment advisor. 